Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. You know the old saw about the importance of trivial things. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost, and so on. Take a dime, for instance. One thin dime. Just chicken feed. Yet it can make the difference between life and death, as it does in the story you are about to hear. Listen, then, and ponder on the potential dimensions of trivia as Lloyd Bridges stars in Chicken Feed. Now. Mr. Lloyd Bridges in Chicken Feed. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. It was a silly thing to fight over, I admit. But there it was. A dime. A measly thin dime. Chicken feed. Of course, that was only the beginning. You see, Junior asked for a dime, and I flipped it over to him. And after he left the room, Mary said I shouldn't spoil the kid. It was time he learned the value of money. And I said, well, great, Scott. If I couldn't give my own child a dime without her jumping down my throat. Oh, you know, those things get going. You keep saying things you shouldn't, and she lashes out with an answer. And before you know it, you've stormed out of the house, and you're taking it out in the car. Fifty miles cooled me down a little, but not much. I automatically slowed up when I came to the sign, You are now entering Lansing, California. Go slow and see our town. Go fast and see our jail. Everybody knew Lansing. A speed trap. A tough town. Driving at a normal speed through the quiet Sunday street gave me time to think of something besides the biting words Mary and I had slugged at each other. I pulled up at a little cafe next to the police station. Had a whitewashed sign in the window. Best cup of coffee in town for ten cents. How you have your eggs this morning, Sherlock? Same as always. No piece of scotch with a fried potato. I resent that, Officer Brady. And what's more, my whole family resents it. Too over easy, Sam. Heavy on the fried. What's yours, mister? Coffee, please. Coming up. Here you are. Say, Officer Brady, how's your star border? Phillips, they're coming for him in the morning. Think you'll be able to hold him till then? He got out of that Bennington jail like a paper bag. Don't worry, sister. Oh, listen to what happened here while I sip my coffee. Best cup of coffee in town for a dime. That reminded me of our argument over a dime. Uh, that's about all a dime's good for, I guess. A cup of coffee, newspaper, phone call. There's a stack of the local papers nearby, and I pulled one over to look at it. This Phillips was on the front page. Bank robber. Killed the teller. Uh, he had a face I wouldn't want to run into close. After a while, the hot coffee cut through the icy core of resentment I'd carried out of the house with me. Maybe, uh, maybe I'd been at fault as much as Mary. She wasn't the only one who had a bad temper. On a sudden impulse, I left my coffee and went over to the phone on the far wall. I heard the dial tone, then I fished in my pocket for change. It was empty. Uh, say, miss, could you change a dollar for me? I want to use the phone. Yes, sir. Uh, what the... Uh, what's the matter, mister? Well, uh, my, my wallet, I seem to... Uh, look, I, I, I'll be back in a minute, huh? No, Mary wasn't the only one with a temper. I'd stormed out of the house without changing the contents of my pockets to my clean suit. I didn't have a dime on me, not even a nickel. I uh, rummaged in the glove compartment of the car. Mary sometimes left a coin purse. But this time, naturally, it wasn't there. I felt like a fool. And then... What seems to be the trouble, mister? Oh, hello, officer. I seem to have come off without any money. It's embarrassing. Yeah, embarrassing. Uh, I didn't realize it until I tried the phone. I, I'll, uh... Well, I'll, I'll have to send that uh, girl a dime for the coffee as soon as I get back to town. You will, huh? Well, I don't know what else I can do under the circumstances. Uh, i better go inside and tell her. Hold on a minute. Huh? Where's your driver's license? <laughs> it's in my wallet in San Francisco. You got any other identification? Well, the, uh, the registration slip in the car. That's the car. What about you? Me? Well, I, I just got through telling you. Officer, I, I'm Ralph Clark. Clark and Jacobs in the Hatfield building? We're, we're attorneys. Attorney. I, I should have a card here somewhere. You're kind of far from home to be without any dough, aren't you? Well, I, I, I came out of the house without changing the stuff into this suit. You know how it yeah. is. Yeah. 
How'd you happen to have the keys to the car? Well, I don't take them out when, I, when it's in the garage. Hey, you, you don't think... Where I... are you headed for? Well, I know it sounds funny, but nowhere, really. See, I, I had a fight with my wife, and I, I just batted out of the house to cool off. I'll tell you what, Mr. Clark, suppose we just mosey into the station house. Station house? Hey, what is this? Nothing, nothing at all. Just next door, and you can call your way from there. I don't see why that's necessary. If you just lend me a dime, I, I could go... Well, I could go right in here and reverse the charges. Let's go. You can leave the car here. I'll take that key. Now, look here, officer. I, I don't get it. Move. I... Come on, move. Hi, Jim. What you got this time? Tell you better after he makes the call. Give me the phone, will you, Ross? It's out of order. One day, half an hour ago. Did you report it? Yeah. They said they can't have a man here before tomorrow. Did you tell him this is a police station for Pete's sake? Sure, I told him. Oh, it's not bad, though. We can get incoming calls. We still got the pay phone over there. Yeah, there's the pay phone, Mr. Clark. You can make your call from there. I don't have any money, remember? Oh, yeah. Okay. Here's the dime. Gee, thanks. Let me speak to your wife when you get her. Uh, this is going to sound fine, just fine. Do you think I've really tied one on? Operator. Uh, I want to call San Francisco, Geary 49978. Hey, and reverse the charges, please. Thank you. Your number, please. Uh, this is uh, 460. Oh, I have a collect call from Lansing, California, for Geary 49978. Will you accept the charges? Lansing. I don't know. It's me, Mary. Take the call. Oh, it's you, is it? What do you think you're doing 50 miles... Will you accept the call, madam? I should say not the very idea. Mary, wait, hey, hey. I am sorry. The party will not accept the call. Look, look, operator, get it back, will you? This is important. I will ring them again. Thanks. Oh, why didn't you pick up that phone? Your party does not answer. (laughs) No soap, huh? Hey, they kept our dime. Well, you shouldn't have slammed it so hard. Let me have another one, will you? I'll get a hold of my partner, huh? He'll identify me. Look, we've wasted enough time. Get in there. But that's the cells. Right. You're locking me up? Right again. What's your big idea? I didn't do anything. What are you charging me with? Don't have to charge you with anything. I'm holding you on suspicion. Suspicion? Suspicion of what? Defrauding the cafe, for one thing. And then I want to check that car. Do you think I stole it? It's been done. Oh, now, wait. Look, if you let me... You're entitled to one call. You've had it. Oh, this is fantastic. I demand to be brought before a magistrate immediately. Are you kidding? In this town on Sunday? In the middle of dove hunting season? Look here, my officer. Now, if you won't let me phone, my partner, he'll clear up everything. Inside. It was one big room. Along one side of it ran three barred cubicles, each just large enough to hold a bunk. Two of the cubicles were opened, and the occupants, a couple of sodden, bleary-eyed drunks, lounged in the open space on a wooden bench that was the only furniture. A sickening odor cut through the disinfectant smell of the place. Hey, welcome to our jail. Stink part of the side of the wave of valley, eh, Slim? Yeah, you said it. What's your beef, John? Suspicion. Can you feature that? Suspicion. And they won't even give me a dime to phone. You mean, you mean you ain't even got a dime? No, you see, I, uh... Yeah, that's too bad. Ain't it, Pete? Sure is. Wish we could help you out. Oh, well, maybe we could at that. Hey, have you got a dime? Well, sure, I got two of them. <laughs> Will you lend me one? Just one, I'll pay you back. <laughs> I- I'll send you ten dollars just as soon as I can get out of here. Well, what's it worth to you, chum? I just told you, ten dollars. Yeah, yeah, I know. A pie in the sky, though. What's it worth now? I mean, I, I can get me a pack of smokes with 20 cents. Give you a dime, I can't get me nothing. You got any smokes on you? No, I wish I had. I left everything in the pockets of my other suit, but... Oh, <laughs> my wristwatch. Why didn't I think of that before? Well, what's the matter with it? There's nothing. Nothing's the matter with it. It's worth $50. Here. Here, you, you look at it. it. It's yours for 10 cents. For one thin dime. Look, what can you lose? Yeah, there must be something wrong with it. Is it hot? Hot? You mean stolen? Of course not. Well, what you offering it for a dime for? I want to get out of this filthy place. Oh, you you don't like our company, is that it? <laughs> if you want to put it that way, no, I don't. Hey, what, what do you think of that, Pete? That man, he don't like our company. We don't smell good to him or something. Well, now, ain't that just too bad? What do you think of that, Mr. Phillips? He don't like us. Have you got any dimes, Mr. Phillips? <laughs> I 
followed his glance. For the first time, I saw deep in the gloom of the locked cubicle the face I'd seen on the front page of the newspaper. The face I'd said that I wouldn't want to run into close. Well, it was close. And I was glad that there were bars between us. Of course, now, us guys, we ain't much. Yeah, but Mr. Phillips here, now, he's a big shot. He robbed four banks and broke out of two jails. Killed a man, too. Hey, sure, we ain't just vags, but Mr. Phillips, he's going to the hot seat. They're coming to get him and take him back to Nevada and burn him. Oh, no, no, Petey, they don't burn him in Nevada, they shoot him. Ain't that right, Mr. Phillips? Mr. Phillips don't want to talk about it. Well, Mr. Phillips don't want to talk about nothing. Mr. Phillips ain't very sociable. Just like this stiff... Oh, now, look, fellas, I didn't mean... Look, I just meant that I wanted to get out of this jail. Here, take the watch and give me the dime, huh? Okay, now, I'll tell you what. I- I'll match your foot. Match me? Yeah, a dime again the watch. Well, uh... Well, that's fair. And I got me a fair chance to get my six, and you got you a chance to get your dime free. Yeah, but I'd rather... Take run... it or leave it. Well, all right. All right, now, you leave Petey hold the watch. I'll flip the dime on the floor and you call. Heads. Tails, I win. Hey, wait a minute. Get your foot off of it. How do you know it's tails? It's tails. Ain't it, Petey? Well, sure, it's tails, all right. Here's watch slip. Hey, what is this? Watch it, brother. You're not going to get away with this. Oh, get him, Pete. <laughs> Don't. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. That'll on you. This is for near and me. Hey, don't. Hey, hey, what goes on Officer, here? Officer, these men. It ain't nothing. This new guy's acting like Yeah, it's this new well, guy. Quiet down in there. Trying to get us in trouble, huh? No, 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 no. Look, fellas, for heaven's oh, sake. Shut up. Okay. Kangaroo. I'll be judge. You be prosecuted. Right. Yeah. All right, prisoner at the bar, stand up. Oh, I said, stand oh, up. Cut it out, will you? Yes. Shut up. <laughs> Yeah, all right, Counselor. What is the prisoner charged with? Well, you want to know, this man here is a desperate criminal. He's charged with breaking into jail, insulting his fellow boarders, poor sportsmanship, and fighting. He's a very dangerous character, you want to? Yeah. Guilty on all counts. Uh, <laughs> I find you. <laughs> Ten cents. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm going to die. Now. <laughs> Can't pay you. Well, then, uh, you can work it out. Rate right of one cent a day. Yeah, first job would be to shine the coarse shoes. <laughs> shine your own shoes. Oh, she could be like that, huh? Hold them, Slater. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Officer! Officer! Yeah, shut up. Officer! I'm down in there! I'll come and get us something to squawk about. You hear that? Another peep out in you. You gonna get it again. You understand? Yes. All right. Now get on them shoes. Well, I, I, I don't have... I don't have anything to shine them with. You got a coat, ain't you? <laughs> now get going. The next hours were unadulterated agony. It was unbelievable the filthy and human jobs they could think up for me to do. It was frightful. And with every move I made, I could feel the glittering, steely eyes of the silent man in the locked cage, following me, weighing me. Finally, when they couldn't think of anything more, they forced me to stand at attention, looking right into Philip's cell. They couldn't see his face. It was too close to mine. But he winked at me and nodded his head as though it were a signal. And then his two huge arms came through the bars and thrust me reeling across the cell. I fell and hit my head. That's all I remember. In a moment, we continue with... Suspense. No parent we know has ever consciously dodged a responsibility to his children. That's why CBS Radio is sure you'll want to act now and learn what you can do about the crisis looming in our universities and colleges. Right now, our institutions are bursting at the seams. America's high birth rate points toward an acute emergency in education in the years ahead. If your children are to have the higher education they'll want and need in order to fulfill their adult obligations, we must all face up to the issue and do what must be done to make sure our colleges get the space, the equipment, and the trained personnel that will be needed. Like to have the facts of the situation, write to Higher Education, Box 36, Times Square Station, New York 36, for a free booklet entitled The Closing College Door. It delineates the problem clearly. 
It outlines what you can do to help remedy the situation. Write for your copy today. The address again is Higher Education, Box 36, Times Square Station, New York 36. And now... We continue with Chicken Feed, starring Mr. Lloyd Bridges. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. I don't know what time it was, two or three in the morning, when I felt a stealthy touch in my shoulder. I opened my eyes. I was still on the stone floor, and Phillips was bending over me, holding a revolver. I started to speak, but he clapped a hand over my mouth. Shh, you fool. You want to wake them punks? Get up quick and be quiet about it. I glanced quickly at Phillips' cell. It was open, and so was the door to the corridor. He pushed me out and locked the door behind us. In his office, bound and gagged securely to his desk chair, Sergeant Ross glared at us. The empty holster to his side told where Phillips had got his gun. Here. Which is the key to your car? Uh, this one. Okay. Take it and let's move. Ah, we made it. <laughs> Make moves. They panic me. Guy could spring that crock with a hairpin. You nearly done a fine job of lousing things up. What happened to you getting thrown in the can in the middle of the day? Huh? Uh, they picked me up on suspicion. Oh, it wasn't supposed to be till midnight tonight. What? And all that phony kid stuff about the dime. The dime? Yeah, all that double talk. When all you had to do was slip me the word that Jerry Diamond sent you. Served you right the way them luscious treated you, acting like a died in the wolf square. Jerry Diamond. Diamond. My numb brain slowly put the meaning of his words into shape. He thought... He thought that I was an accomplice. Sent by a partner to help him break jail. But all my screams about a dime had been nothing but a signal to him. A signal that I came from Jerry Diamond. I cast a quick glance sideways at the revolver held loosely but ready in his lap. At the eyes that never lost their iciness even when he laughed. It wasn't hard to guess what he would do when he found out his mistake. Jerry, you got the hideout set up? Uh, yes. Where is it? The, the hideout? The hideout. We're going to Jerry's place first, right? Then what? Uh, <clears throat> well, I'll take you to Jerry's and uh, then he'll take over from there. Mm. How far is it to Jerry's? Can't be more than about five miles, is it? Well, it's... Uh, look behind you. Huh? What's the matter? There's a car following us without lights. Well, I don't see... What the... Hey, 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 what's the big idea? You trying to cross uh, me? I couldn't help it. My, my foot uh, slammed on the brake. That car. We've got to get out of here. All right. Go ahead. Get it started. Come on, come get on. Get started. All right. <clears throat> I'm getting out to let car pass us. You make for the other side, and no tricks. Just to make sure, I'll take this key. I had made myself a chance, and I took it. I slipped out of the car on the other side and ran across the fields until I could run no more. After a long time, I found a road. And after a while of tramping along that road, a dark shape loomed up before me, a gas station. And through the glass, I could make out the outline of a telephone. I tried the door. It was locked, of course. I found a tire iron and sprang the latch. I ran to the phone to make my call. And then I saw the coin slot, gaping at me like a laughing mouth. In a rage, I shook the black box. I could hear the dimes inside, behind a sheet of metal no thicker than a playing card, yet as inaccessible as the moon. But there must be some money in this room. My eyes focused on the battered desk. There was some change in it and a couple of dollar bills kind of money that a man will leave as a sop to possible burglars. Burglars? That meant me. Carefully, I abstracted a single dime and went to the phone. Number, please. Uh, get me San Francisco. Fillmore, 33265. It's Morris Jacobs. Uh, tell him uh, this is his partner, Ralph Clark, and ask him to accept the charges. Thank you. There's an interruption on the line, and there may be a slight delay, sir. Will you hold on, or shall I ring you? Yeah, I'll hold on, but hurry, operator. It's important. One moment, please. As I waited, a glint of light pulled my eyes away from the phone. Far down the road, the headlights of a car joggled over the rise and aimed toward me. 
was the first car to come by since I'd hit the road. It might be a stray, a farmer starting out before sunup, but I couldn't take the chance. Hastily, I hung up the receiver, closed the cash drawer, and snapped the lock on the door. Then I crouched beneath the desk, and not a moment too soon. Open up! Hey! I've tried to wake this character before. Sleeps like a dead man. Especially if he's back on the bottle again. We'll get him up. Hey, Jerry! Then I heard the creak of bed springs from the rear of the station. The light appeared under an inside door. It opened, and two hairy barefoot legs under a flannel nightgown came through and made for the front door. Who is it? Brady and Ross, up and up. <laughs> You're a fine bunch of cops running out of gas in the middle of the night. Come on in. That's chilly with the door open. It ain't gas, pal. Phillips broke jail. Huh? How'd he do it? Well, there was two of them. He had an accomplice. Said he was a lawyer. First thing I know, I'm looking into the muzzle of my own gun. You know, they say Phillips used to work for Houdini once. All and... right, Ross. We don't have all night. Point is, we found their car abandoned on the road back of Ferris's hop field. Ran out of gas. It can't be far away. Hmm. Hey, there was a big reward for Phillips after he broke jail at Bennington, wasn't there? Yeah, a thousand dollars. Say, Jerry, you know him, don't you? You were in the Bennington pokey when he made that break. What was it, a drunken disorderly or something? Yeah. Yeah, had me a little too much and broke a window in the general store. <laughs> we were roommates for the night. I was pretty scared. How'd he do it? The break. I don't know. I was sleeping at all. Thousand dollars reward, huh? A man could do a lot with a thousand dollars. Not dead, he couldn't. Don't you go getting any ideas now. That Phillips is a killer and so is his partner, most likely. Well, I ain't exactly helpless myself. A nice little fella on my side. Now, you take my advice, chum, and put that gun away. They show up here, you talk soft and let us do the capturing. Sure, sure, I'll play safe. Well, uh, we'll be going. Just wanted to alert you, Jack. Yeah, thanks. So long, boys. All right, you. Come out from under that desk. Come on out, I say. This gun's getting mighty nervous. Now, get your hands up. Stand over there. Uh, now, I'll look, mister. I... I'll do the talking. Who are you? you got to believe me. I'm not a criminal. I'm a lawyer. Oh, oh, so you must be the other one. Keep them hands up. I got into this by accident. But he helped me escape, yes, but... Where is Phillips? I left him in the car. That's another thing. You can get the reward. I know who he's going to meet. They're going to a hideout. Oh, I see. Well, who is he going to meet? Somebody named Jerry Diamond. There. There, if you let me get to that phone, I can clear up everything. No, you don't. You stay where you are, I'll plug you. But that's my partner, my law partner in San Francisco. I only broke in here so I could phone him. He'll identify me. <laughs> you don't believe me? Oh, I believe you. Well, answer it yourself. Huh? You'll see. Not on your life, mister. You think I'm out of my mind? But you've got to answer it. You don't know what I went through to place that call. You can't just stand it. There... Jerry. You're Jerry Diamond. That's right. Jerry. Jerry. Who's that? Turn off that light, too. Phillips. Stand over there by the window where I can see you. Go on. Jerry! Come on in, Phillips. I ran out of gas in that pump that you said. It happened so fast that for a moment I had no reaction at all. None. I just watched it. Watched Phillips holding his chest with both hands. Watched that giant body twist convulsively on the floor and then lie still. Watch Jerry bend over him, and then straighten up. Then as he turned grinning, my emotion, my, my feeling came back. And what I felt was seething, overpowering rage, fury. Everything I'd been through this night was like a boiler that had to burst. Dead or alive, I just made me a thousand bucks. You foul, stinking old man. Huh? You're worse than he is. Ah, oh, shut up. Maybe I'll get a reward for you, too. A small one. <laughs> I could feel the bullet land on my side, just below the belt. The avenues of pain spread out like the cracks in a hammered window glass. But somehow, strangely, it didn't stop me. I kept moving toward him. He backed away, surprised. He was aiming for another shot when we grappled. I got the gun, and he got my throat. I stumbled. I held onto his hand that was holding the gun. I wouldn't let go. And as he fell backwards into the chair, I was on top of him. And as we threshed around there on the floor, I brought his hand up suddenly and smashed the gun into his face. And then he lay still. I listened to his heart. It was 
was all right. He was all right. Then I realized that... that I was all right. Yet he'd shot me, hit me. I should be lying there on the plank floor instead of that grotesque heap in the shapeless flannel nightgown. I felt my side where the bullet had struck. Brought my hand away. There was no blood on it. There should be blood. Touch the spot again. I fingered the contour of something small and hard and round. I pulled it out of my watch pocket. A dime. A dime. The tenth part of a dollar. All a man needed to buy a cup of coffee. To make a phone call. To pay a fine in a kangaroo court. To save his life. And I'd had it all the time. I had had it all the time. starred in William N. Robeson's production of Chicken Feed by Lawrence Goldman. Listen. Listen again next week when we bring you Francis' letter in Escape to Death. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Supporting Mr. Bridges and Chicken Feed were Amzie Strickland, Betty Groverly, Ted DeCorsa, Lou Krugman, Jack Crucian, Charlie Lung, Lou Merrill, and Dick Legrand. 